Ben Sotos, how you doing, hey. man? Hey, how's it going, Juan? How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. I'm glad to have you on the show. Yeah, you know, I appreciate the invite. I'm glad that we could finally lock this down. I apologize for it taking a couple of weeks, but, uh, you know, the old day job gets in the way sometimes of the real estate. Hey, it's life, right? It's what, what we call life. So it, it happens, man. It happens to all of us. So it's, it's good. It's good. Um, where are you calling us from, Ben? I'm calling from Houston, Texas. Uh, yep, I got an office on the northwest side. I'm not sure if anybody might be listening uh, is familiar with uh, 290, 1960 area, but uh, that's where I office out of. So that's where I'm calling you from. Oh, great, great. And how, how, is, how are things going over there? Good, good, good. Yeah, I own an IT company. So uh, we're rolling, rocking and rolling and uh, just uh, balancing that with uh, the commercial real estate side. And, you know, luckily, uh, you know, I'm a partner at the IT company. So I have some flexibility in that respect. But uh, yeah, things are going great. Great. I like to hear that. Okay, well, then uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Ben. And, and uh, you know, just go, go ahead and, and uh, tell us, you know, how you, uh, how you even, you know, uh, got started in real estate and what triggered that? Well, I mean, I think uh, that's a long story. Uh, it starts with Robert Kiyosaki and uh, starts with uh, the birth of my daughter, really. You know, uh, you know, my, my uh, daughter's mother was, was pregnant with Lillian, my daughter, and uh, we had a lot of time on our hands. You know, we weren't doing very much at that point. So I had about nine months where I could really kind of get caught up on a lot of reading. And one of the things that I was always interested in was real estate. So, you know, I, I obviously loaded up on a bunch of real estate books, a lot of it being Robert Kiyosaki stuff and some of the, the other folks that are part of his kind of, I'd say, inner circle or his team um, and really got into real estate at that point. Well, then, you know, I was uh, at Facebook, you know, I don't know how they know, but, you know, there, there I started seeing Robert Kiyosaki ads, you know, and he was supposedly coming to town, right? So you sign up to go see him and it's just kind of a free pitch fest essentially, you know, and, uh, you know, really got you fired up. So then you kind of pay for the three day seminar, you go to that. And then from there, it's like, okay, if you really want to know how to do it, then you, you, you pay up and, <laughs> and you, uh, you know, you do his pay classes. Up another 50 grand. <laughs> yeah. Well, not quite that much, but it was a lot more than, uh, than I, when I look back on it, I'm like, man, I could have probably done a couple more deals on the amount of money I spent on it, but it was all good stuff because I learned a good foundation of, real estate knowledge and terminology and it's all about taking that real estate knowledge and terminology and just that baseline information and actually going out and doing something with it well you know obviously i'd spent a ton of money on the training and so you know i'm, I'm probably best with my back against the wall so you know i felt like hey i need to go back and at least make that up so um, the easiest way for a lot of people to get into real estate is wholesaling you know, and so for me, it was a real just easy transition into bandit signs and, you know, uh, direct mail and that type of stuff. A lot of networking at RIA's and I ended up getting into wholesaling. Now, what people don't really know about wholesaling is, is a great thing, but it's still a job. And so after about a year, year and a half of doing that, I was fairly successful, but it was a lot of work and the pay wasn't as much as I was expecting. You know, when I was giving up time for my IT job to do a wholesale that I was making three grand on, it just, it just didn't make a lot of sense. You start kind of adding up the numbers. So I was always looking for another way to scale. So in order to scale, you know, you have to get into kind of commercial real estate and another niche within commercial real estate for me was multifamily. You know, now I'd heard, a, you know, uh, Del Wamsley here in Houston on the radio. I was always interested in that. So around that same time, you know, I went to Dell's two day boot camp and man, he gets you fired up. Right. So, yeah, you know, um, you know, uh, that Sunday afternoon I was ready to, you know, buy an apartment walking out of that thing. Now, <laughs> I didn't end up, you know, I'm friends with a lot of lifestyles <laughs> folks. I, I didn't yeah. end up going down that route. Uh, cause I'd already spent a ton of money with Robert Kiyosaki. Um, but you know, I, I got the foundation of what I needed to do in order to get started. And that was really to build my team. You know, so then I went out and you know, obviously started doing a lot of networking and looking for people that I could kind of um, partner up with, essentially, because, you know, obviously, you know, I do have a day job, you know, you need to leverage other people's either experience, net worth or time in order to do this as a team sport, multifamily investing, that is. And so, you know, I found my, my two business partners, Ron Johnson and, and Lupe Alaberas, and we got into it. We, we formed a company. 
And around that same time, I had, I was still going to a lot of networking events. I was going to Rio's. I went to Ridge club here in Houston. And, um, from there I actually heard Brad Sumrock speak and, um, you know, he got you fired up to, uh, not as much as Dell does, but he was, you know, a Dell protege. So he kind of knows what he's doing. So I ended up signing up for Brad's group and I went through that process for about two years. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I got the, I got even more knowledge and from there I met my business partner on my first deal, Mike Cartage, Frank Hauser. Um, we actually, you know, obviously got the deal through my Cartage. So I feel, I feel like all this stuff that I've learned, it was, it was leading to something else. Right. You know, so, I mean, yeah, I paid a lot of money, but I also learned a lot and I met a lot of good people along the way. So I always encourage anybody that's getting into multifamily or getting into commercial real estate, unless your family is doing it and they're going to teach you how to do it, or you've got a close friend that will let you shadow them. You really need to pay up and learn how to do it because otherwise, uh, and not to say that you can't partner with somebody that already has experience. That's another way to go about it. But if you don't have any of those things, you really need to find a group, you know? So, you know, I've since found think multifamily with Mark Kinney and he's a great guy and I'm a part of that group now. And I, I feel like that's, that's my continuing education process as well as just being able to get out there and continue to network, which I enjoy doing. That's what I do for my IT job anyway, is sales and business development. So getting out there and networking is a big important part of the process too. So that all led me to obviously my first deal, then my second deal. Now I'm under contract for my third deal. We just got another LOI that's essentially accepted. We're just kind of working out the, the, the fine point. So once you get that first deal, things really start to kind of accelerate, you know, now, not to mention, not, not to mean that there's going to be, cause there was actually 12 months between my first and the second deal, but it was significantly easier to get the buy-in of the brokers and the lenders and everybody else along the process. Once you can already point that, Hey, I've already done a deal. Right. So, um, you know, I'm tr obviously trying to accelerate and scale up because you get to a point where you, you don't, it's no longer a hobby, right? It's, it's a career path that you want to take. And so you're wanting to obviously continue that effort. And so in order to do that, you got to keep going, you got to keep scaling up, you got to delegate out, you got to hire on folks, you got to, it's now it's a business, right? And you want to get it to a point where it's self-sustaining. And so I'm kind of me and my new business partner, uh, Ferris Musa, we started up a company called disrupt equity and uh, we're really looking at it from a long term vision standpoint. And so, you know, we are going to obviously be investing in that company in order to grow it very quickly in order to scale up and obviously hire on people and allow us to kind of look at finding the deals and, and, and working with our investors, which I feel are the two most important parts. You can get caught up in the minutia of the whole process and that's a lot of stuff that you can delegate out to other people. But if you really want to be a true syndicator, you need to know your deals. You need to know where to find your deals and you need to know where, where, what your investors are looking for and you need to know where to find that money. So that's the most important thing that we want to focus on. So it got me all the way to obviously 2018 and here I am, you know, obviously doing, doing podcasts and trying to give back to folks, you know, um, you know, but uh, yeah, it's been a long journey, but it's been an exciting one. Yeah, you just you you uh, you went through a whole lot in, in this uh, short period of time, and, and that's that's awesome. Um, and I think a lot of people will, uh, will truly uh, learn uh, different uh, different areas that you just covered. So let, let's start from the very beginning. Uh, let's start with your your first multifamily deal because you went you went from wholesaling right, and then you yep. you figured that you had a, you had to scale up a little bit, right? Yep. So so you decided to get into multifamily because it was more scalable, mm -hmm. um, and it's easier, right? It becomes easier, really. It, it didn't then then uh. Well, I wouldn't First say that it's, thing, right? It, it, you're right. There's okay. So I guess both can be easy, right? I think you just have to have the skill set and the experience to make them. You have to systemize everything. You have to make things efficient. It's like any other business, right? You know, um, wholesaling could have been a lot easier for me and I've, I've met successful wholesalers. I mean, they're doing 10, 20 deals a month, but they've systemized it. They've turned it into a business and they've gotten, they've hired on employees. So I could have done that, but I didn't really, that, 
I was, that was just, you're chasing your next deal every single time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I was, I was looking for something different once I knew what I was looking for. Right. 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 You're into real estate, you just want to do a deal. Exactly. So right. I finally kind of stepped back and said, okay, I want to be a little bit more strategic about it. What am I trying to do here? And really I was trying to build up long-term wealth building. And the best way to do that is commercial real estate. And within that, like I said, I found multifamily, which was a very scalable asset class for me. And it made a lot of sense, you know, so that's kind of, you know, when I found out about all these different groups and stuff like that, but to kind of, you know, take it all back to the beginning, you know, my first deal once again, was all about networking. You know, I was within, a, I was within a group. I met uh, a gentleman named Mike Hartage. He owned in a city called Beaumont. So if anybody is familiar with Texas, Beaumont is about an hour and a half east on I-10 from Houston. So not too far away from where I live. You know, it's still, it's still close enough where I can go kick tires if I need to. <laughs> and he already owned there. So he was getting deals off market deals from brokers that were selling other deals there in that Beaumont area. Well, he had had another deal that um, he had essentially passed on. You know, I mean, I was kind of a newbie. I was like, Hey, I just want to look at deals. I just want to analyze deals. Do you have anything that maybe you passed on? Well, he said, yeah, I got this one deal. It's called Huntington park. So I kind of take a look at it and you know, what I really ended up finding out was he had looked, he had looked at it very, very quickly and realized and thought that it was a bad deal. But really what had happened is that they had loaded up a lot of capital expenditures up on the top of the line and it was really dragging down the NOI. And it really, if you, if you really adjusted the, the P and L and made it, you know, really what it should be that the, the price that they were asking for it was like a 10 cap. Yeah. So, so just to clarify guys, the, the CapEx should be below the line, right? Correct. So can you, can Correct. you go, go into that a little bit more? A bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You know, I, I, I throw these, I throw yeah, these. For, for the guys that don't know it and they're trying yeah. to figure it out. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, there's a long time that I didn't know this stuff too. It's just now it's been like beaten into my head. Right. You yeah. know, so, you know, obviously you've got capital expenditures, which are usually one time items, you know, say you got to replace the roof, right. And it's a hundred thousand bucks. You're not going to be replacing the roof every year. Well, hopefully Hopefully, Hopefully not. not. Hopefully <laughs> not. Right? So you're not. That's not going to be an expense on your P and L, right? That's going to be below the NOI as a one-time thing that you had to pay for. So therefore, it doesn't drag down your bottom line, your NOI, your net. It doesn't operating. affect the NOI. It, yeah, should, it, should not, not, it does not net. affect the, your NOI. Yeah. Correct. Your net operating income, right? And so, you know, once we started making those adjustments on the Huntington Park financials, we realized that it was an incredible deal. And, you know, obviously, you know, the first thing I did was go back to Mike and say, hey, man, this is a great deal. We need, we, need to, we need to wrap this up before somebody else finds out that it's a great deal. So we, we, you know, we didn't even haggle with the guy. We just, you know, yeah, we'll pay you the three million. <laughs> Here you go. We went straight to it, right? You're like, okay, yeah, yeah let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, here's, here's 3 million. Let's get this thing going. So we went through that process and all of these have struggles and delays and all that other stuff. It takes a while, you know, so it took about three to six months, I think from that time to when we actually closed it. And there's just a lot of things, nothing bad. It just takes a long time. It takes a while. So, yeah. You know, that was back in 2016, you know, and we've been kind of going through that, that whole process, you know, for a while. And, uh, you know, I'd actually found out about my next deal, which is called Longfellow in October of 2016. And, you know, I had originally passed on that one um, just because, you know, we, we, we were trying to stabilize Huntington and, you know, I just didn't have enough time to really look at it that closely. Well, then I kind of back in January of 2017, I started looking at it again. You know, we went and did the property tour and all that stuff. Well, then we were interested. So for a lot of different reasons, we finally got it to a point where they were accepting our LOI, but it just got delayed upon delays upon delays with the seller and the broker wasn't very uh, helpful. And that took a long time too. So we got it all the way to about July of 2017 and we were getting close to actually signing the contract and then Harvey hit. So um, oh no! <laughs> for anybody, you know, obviously they watched the news around the, uh, late August, early September, and they probably heard about Hurricane Harvey. Uh, well, Beaumont got, got, got hit there too. What about your property? How was your property? It turned so, out to be okay? So Huntington Park, you know, took on some water. There was about three inches because Huntington Park was actually three miles away from, from Longfellow, which was my new acquisition, right? Your second and, one, right? Yeah, my second one. Yeah. And so it, it ended up taking on about 30 units. We had to um, obviously 
obviously, you know, terminate the leases because we had to go through the whole thing. And this is 30 units out of how many, how many units did you have? 92. Oh, yep. That's total. a good, that's, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah. 92 units was the total. We had to take down about 30. Um, so a third, basically, essentially. A yeah. third of it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always risks in this, right? But the way that you mitigate that is that you're properly insured. So, you know, to kind of get into that process a little bit. So you obviously, we had flood insurance on it. Anything along the coast, I would suggest anybody get that because even though it's an additional expense, it's well worth it in times like this. And so how much does that additional expense or the additional insurance cost? What, okay, what, is, so what does it cost we, you like for the whole year? Oh, well, you'd be, you'd be, it's really actually not that expensive. I think it was like 9,000 bucks for the 92 units, you know, and, you know, so, and it ended up paying out close to $2 million. Now we didn't necessarily have that much work that needed to be done, but that's what the insurance adjusters, you know, said, Hey, this is how much, how much needed. And this is how much we're going to give you. So we went ahead and we, we updated the whole entire property and, and we're actually about, we're back up to about 87% occupancy right now. So there's awesome. always risks there, you know, and, and I always want to tell people that, that, you know, don't, don't expect this to be just, you know, sit back and relax type business. There are always, there's always things that you need to kind of be aware of. And obviously there's risks that you can mitigate through properly being insured. You know, you got your, your cat, you're fully capitalized. You've got that type of stuff going on for it. So, so was, let's, let's, let's touch on the, uh, the insurance process. How did, how did that, how does it work exactly? Like you have a property that, that uh, gets damaged because of a flood. Yep. Um, what does the process look like from so that point it's, forward? It's the same thing. And everything is run. The flood insurance, national flood insurance policy, NFIP, is, is all run through FEMA, right? And so, and it's the same process as um, somebody that has flood insurance on their house. Um, so anybody that's familiar with that process, you know, I, I essentially you go through a broker, you buy the insurance, it costs a certain amount of money. It depends on how much, you know, square footage there is and a couple different factors too. Is it, is it a, is it a rental? Is it a residence? Is it a commercial building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got their little scale of what it's, what it's going to cost. Right. And so, you know, you go through that and you buy that. Now, sometimes the, the bank will let you escrow it. Sometimes you just have to pay it out of pocket, but one way or the other, it's a good investment. So whenever it flooded, you call in there and you say, Hey, you know, you know, we, we had a flood event, you know, and then they kind of open up a case number for you. Right. And then they send the insurance adjusters out there and they do their thing. And then, you know, we had three different adjusters, um, to make it overly complicated and they sent three instead of one and, um, they spent, you know, a better part of a day each, um, kind of going through each unit, what's needed, what needs to be replaced you know, what stuff will they cover? Won't they cover all that stuff? And then they write up a whole big report called a proof of loss. They submit that over to FEMA and then FEMA from there determines, okay, yeah, this is legit. We're going to go ahead and start cutting checks. Well, all that is escrowed with your lender. So, you know, it's just like a draw, right? So we'll endorse the check. We send it off to our lender. Then they run the whole process. So, you know, we start the work with our general contractor that we had identified pretty quickly after the process. And essentially what happens is, you know, once he gets to a certain point, he says, okay, you know, obviously I need to get paid. So we order an inspection from the lender. The lender uh, sends their inspector out there. He verifies that everything on the invoice has been done Then they cut the check and then we continue the work. Right. So it's just like any other draw. So if right. people have done flips and stuff like that, it's the same concept. Essentially, they're not just giving us the money. They're the steward of it. And, uh, you know, we just have to kind of go along with the process, but it, it, it was actually a blessing in disguise because, you know, when we had taken over the property, um, you know, we were only able to do a certain amount of CapEx and rehab on it. And so, and, and a lot of that was just deferred maintenance. We weren't able to, um, we weren't able to really be able to do the interiors like we wanted to do them. So, you know, that gave us the opportunity to update 30 something units on the interior side, which obviously drives revenue. I mean, because what, what, you're not getting any extra rent from replacing roofs and replacing HVACs and- No, repaving. that's not gonna drive you any, any yeah, uh, repaving, the NOIL. Parking lot. P P your tenants just expect you to do that. Okay? Exactly. You're not gonna get a $50 rent bump because you repave the, the, the parking lot, even though it might've cost you a hundred grand to do it, which they quite possibly could have. But they will pay for updated amenities, they'll pay for updated interiors. And so the Harvey actually allowed us to do that on Huntington 
whereas we weren't able to do that before. So it was somewhat of a blessing. It was a very painful process. You know, it was very heartbreaking to, to have to obviously terminate leases, but we're, we've been able to work with, you know, the tenants that were there before we give them, you know, obviously concessions to get them back in. And it's actually turned out to be a blessing in the skies. Well, three miles away was where, um, Longfellow was at and Longfellow was up a little bit closer to I-10 drainage was a lot better actually didn't take on any water and oh, so that's awesome you know so you know but this this we were supposed to sign the contract right around the time Harvey hit so obviously the seller was was flexible he understood what the, pro, what the deal was so he didn't you know he gave us some time he gave us about a month to kind of get our ducks in a row and figure out what we wanted to do so about end of October or no excuse me beginning of October we decided okay we're ready to move forward. You know, we've got Huntington kind of humming. We know what we got to do there. You know, we, we obviously still like the deal. It still makes sense. So we went ahead and got under contract with Longfellow, um, October one ended up closing that January 19th. So as you can see, I mean, it takes better part of a year, at least. Yeah, it, takes, it takes some, some good communication and some good, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, massaging, well, it's, it's, massaging the relationship with the with the owner, right? Well, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I ended up I ended up working that directly with the seller, which is kind of unique. Um, you know, we went ahead and circumvented the broker on the deal because he just wasn't being very helpful on it. And so I had known the seller actually ended up being one of them was the same seller that I bought in Huntington from. So I actually knew these guys. They were out of Ohio. And uh, I called him up and just said, you know, um, you know, what's going on? Why is there a delay? And he thought I was delaying and I thought he was delaying. And really, when, <laughs> at the end of the day, it was the broker. Oh, so no. we, we kind of worked together and said, well, let's just work this thing out. Yeah. So I ended up, you guys. Yeah. yeah, I ended up negotiating a multi-million dollar deal directly with the seller for about six months. And he was a good guy. And his name's Cliff Drubnick and he's out of Ohio. He's a CPA and he had owned the property for like 30 years. Oh, wow. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and so, you know, obviously, you know, we, we got a good working relationship and we worked it out and every, it was amicable. Everybody was happy at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, we ended up closing that on July 19th. Well, a week prior, you kind of get your, you know, uh, clear to close, right? And it's, you know, how it would be called in a single family world. And it's the same type of concept. You just get approved, right? Um, that same day, I got a call from, from, you know, my business partner, Ferris Musa, and he said, Hey, you know, we've got our LOI accepted in Atlanta. So on the same day that I got a clear to close, I also got an LOI accepted. So once I closed out Longfellow, I started working a hundred percent on my Atlanta deal, which is called Laurel Mill. And, you know, I mean, we flew out there and, you know, we did due diligence and we're probably going to be closing that on or around April 20th. Well, while we were out there, we toured several different properties and, you know, we ended up offering on one of them and that was the one that we, we pretty much got an accepted LOI on as well. So you, you, but it's all, it's a numbers game, right? You have to continue to make offers. You have to continue to do property tours because in this part of the market cycle, the people that are getting deals done are the ones that are just making offers, making offers, making offers and doing tours, doing tours, doing tours, tours. And they're working with the brokers. They're not just sitting back hoping that, you know, if I analyze one deal this month, that maybe that's the one deal that's going to work out. Cause that's not going to be the case. You're going to, it be, doesn't work like that. No, nope. yeah, you're going to be twiddling your thumbs for a very long time and you'll never find a deal. Now I'm not telling anybody to be aggressive with their underwriting because you should always, you should always underwrite very conservatively if you can, but realize that if you really want to do a deal that you've got to make that extra effort to actually get it done. So, so what, what, what led you to Atlanta? Um, you know, you're in Houston and your other two properties are here just yep. outside of Houston. So, you know, why Atlanta? Well, you know, uh, Houston and I'd just say Texas in general has really heated up. Um, cap rates have compressed and just for folks that, you know, obviously listen to this cap rates is just the multiple, right? And so whenever it compresses, that means that things are more expensive. And so it's really hard to get a good return um, in parts of Texas, mainly Houston, DFW, and Austin. You know, now there's some tertiary cities like Beaumont and some other places that are a little bit, got a little bit higher cap rates, a little bit better cash flow. Um, but, you know, I've always liked Atlanta. I actually do business there on the IT side, and I'm very familiar with Atlanta, and I know how diversified the economy is. 
And so um, that's one of the reasons that I was attracted to it. And then I also know some very smart money that has been investing in Atlanta as well. So, you know, no, there's no, there's no fault in being a follower in some of this stuff. So no. <laughs> if you see smart money investing in something, that's some, that's a reason why you should at least look at it. I'm not saying you have to follow the herd and all, and all but they probably know something that you might not know. And so we started really looking in Atlanta and we found out the cap rates were, you know, what Texas's was three, four, five years ago. So they're just in a different part of the market cycle. So we really started focusing on that. And, and really once you get one property in the area, it really doesn't make sense to just have that one property. You need to, you, you really should, you know, get some economies of scale going. So you want to get two, three, four, maybe five properties, not necessarily in that exact sub market, but try to get it in that Atlanta area. So whenever you've got to, if you're investing out of state, like I am, I can fly in, I can spend a day or two and I can look at all of my properties versus flying in and just looking at one. I mean, I'm still spending the same amount of money on a plane ticket right. on a hotel. So why not spread that across multiple properties? And it also gives you some, um, some, you know, I, I guess, uh, clout with the brokers is how I'd probably describe that. You know, Hey, I own this or I own that. And so they already know that you're in the market, you understand the market and you're an, you're an actual player. So that gives you a little bit of credibility. Let's and, and also helps with your property management. You know, you have a, your property management company that instead of overseeing one, one of your assets, uh, they can oversee, you know, multiple two or three yeah. or whatever. So you become, it works you're, out you're, great. You're a little bit higher on their, on their, um, priority radar right? Yeah. yeah the priority yeah. list, right? Yeah. You know, you're not just that, Oh, I got this one guy and he owns this, you know, this one property and you know, but now you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're a big part of their, their business. And so they'll take care of you. And then they, you get that economies of scale because you know, once you get on board with a, with a fairly decent sized property management company, they'll roll you in and you'll get the benefit of a lot of different things, whether it be a, you know, better pricing on appliances or sometimes they can roll you into an umbrella insurance policy, all these different things that you end up seeing a decrease in your expenses too. So how hard is it to enter a new market? I mean, you, you went from Houston to Atlanta and you talked about Atlanta and it's a, it's a great, it seems like it's a great, uh, great market. There are different points in the, the market cycle. How difficult is it to, to, for someone that has not invested in a different uh, market to, to actually go into it? I'd say, you know, it's, it, it really depends on your level of experience overall, right? I don't necessarily know if it's any more difficult to invest in one market or another, even if you're out of state. I would say it's all about, do you have experience just investing in multifamily in general, right? You could, can you walk the walk and talk the talk? You know, because you're still talking with brokers, right? Most of the time, people are not going to be working directly with the seller, you know, but for, you know, for the most part, 80, 90% of the deals are getting done through the broker. So if you can talk NLI, cap rates, all these different terminologies that make you look like you kind of know what you're doing and that you can close the deal. I mean, it's all about confidence that whoever is going to be under contract for this deal can close it. So that's what the broker is ultimately looking for, you know, and if they don't feel confident in that, then they'll, they'll dismiss that, that offer or they'll try to minimize it. So they go with somebody that they know can close the deal. So I would say it's all about experience in general. And then you can really, you can segue that into any market that you're really looking at as long as you understand the market too, right? You don't, I wouldn't suggest that anybody just start willy nilly making offers, you know, especially even if it looks good on paper, I'd still do research on the market in general. Like I said, you know, me and my business partner, I was very familiar with Atlanta and so was he, you know, I, I get out there several times a year already. So I already knew that it was a very good economy. Um, so it really wasn't as risky, but say, you know, I want to invest in, I don't know, Chicago, right? You know, I've been to Chicago, but five years ago, you know, I know, know it's a great economy, but I don't really know much about it. So I'd probably sit back and instead of making offers first, I do research on that. That you got you to know what you're doing, what you're getting yeah. into. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you, uh, you brought a lot of great information, uh, a lot of great uh, tips for everybody. So yep. um, let's, uh, let's switch over to our nuggets of wealth. Okay. Ready for that? Yeah. Yeah. What, what key tip would you give to those multifamily investors uh, who are looking to scale up and reach a bigger level such as yourself? Yeah. And that it takes time. I'd, I'd say, you know, look at, look at being patient first, you know, not everything is going to happen right away. I've been doing this for three or four years already. I've been in real estate for five or six. It takes time, you know, so I'd always say be patient first. The second thing that I always suggest to people is find a good partner 
find a good group of folks that are doing deals already and sync up with those folks and learn as much as you can because it's a team sport. Yeah, even if you've got $100 million in the bank, yeah, maybe you can do some deals on your own, but why would you? You know, why wouldn't you leverage somebody else's time and experience doing deals? And, and so I always say, be patient, find a good partner, find a, a potentially a mentoring group if you feel if you you feel you need that and then and then go out and start making offers great points patience patience yeah, have patience. have some great patience and and wait for, wait for the right time yep. exactly uh surround yourself with others that are doing it you know at a higher level than you are absolutely what what do you have to sacrifice to get to where you are today and how do you stay committed well, I don't have too much hair left, so I, <laughs> you know, I couldn't. Just, I, I, that one was that was already gone. A lot of stress, huh? My IT job already took that away from me. No, no, you you do you need you're going to be burning the candle on on both ends for sure. You know, especially if you've got a day job, and most people that I know starting off do. So just be prepared that yeah, there's going to be some late nights. There's going to be some working on weekends, and and I always suggest to people like you know if you're a doctor and you're on call, or you're a lawyer and you work seventy hours a week this is probably not, you're not going to be a successful syndicator unless you put that to the side. And a lot of people that are lawyers and doctors and, and those types of folks, that's their profession. They love it and they, they will never do that. So just be prepared that you're not going to be able to syndicate deals. You know, if, if you've got a certain type of job that, um, you know, doesn't allow you to do it. So right. you know, just, just know that it is going to be a lot of hustling, especially at the beginning until you can scale up to a point where you can delegate off to say a VA or maybe even hire on employees, you know, until then you're going to be working. It's a business. It's a business. Great points. I love that. Yep. What is one key tool source or platform that you use frequently that can help also help others? <sighs> Well, there's, there's several, right? You know, I mean, I think um, you really can do this business from pretty much anywhere you want, as long as you've got an internet connection and a phone, you know, that's really the, the basic tools. I mean, you know, you can hustle deals from a Starbucks if you really wanted to, but I would say to keep organized, um, you know, Ferris, you know, my business partner got us onto a sauna you know, and that's a good kind of collaboration tool where you're able to kind of track tasks and, you know, obviously assign those tasks and make sure that they're being followed up on and stuff like this, because really when you're doing a closing and when, uh, when actually, when you're looking for deals, there's a lot of different moving parts and you really need to keep track of that. So I would suggest people to look into that and then also just look into the CRM, you know, start putting in brokers into a CRM, you know, get them on a follow-up campaign. You know, you're establishing your credibility, you're establishing a, a relationship relationship with these folks. So if you're calling, uh, you know, a broker in Houston once every six months, he probably isn't even going to remember you. So you need to really kind of keep in contact with those folks. So I'd say identify a CRM as well, you know, um, where you can kind of put, put all the different contacts that you've made over the years in there and then follow up with those people. Yeah. And, and to add to that, you can also put in your, uh, your investors or, or any, anybody else that you, that you want. You know, That's in. great. And, and yeah, you just, and I forgot to mention that a great tool, you know, I use, I, I use MailChimp. It's a free tool where I put all my investors in, um, you know, it's got some good, good free templates. It's also got a paid version of it, obviously. Um, you know, that's got even more features, but yeah, obviously keeping track and getting those investors into your database and then trying to reach out to them as, as frequently as you can to, to obviously, once again, you're trying to cultivate a, a relationship with these people. It's not, you know, I mean, if you meet them once at a networking event and they don't hear from you for a year, the likelihood that they're even going to remember who you are is very small. So try to try to reach out to them as much as you can as well. Great points. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, you, you brought some some great key points. MailChimp uh, is, is one one that uh, that uh, many people use and is very helpful. So, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, what is a life changing book that you have read? Or, or are currently reading that, uh, that you, you can recommend to others? Well, I mean, currently, um, you know, I'm reading uh, Tony Robbins. It's called Unshakable. Um, Tony, uh, Tony Robbins is a big fan of his. Um, you know, and that's kind of more about, uh, you know, kind of equities and bonds and stuff like that. It's not necessarily all about real estate, but it's about financial planning and being financially astute. Um, you know, but I would say the number one real estate book that got me into real estate is Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I would suggest if you have not read that and you're trying to get into real estate or you are in real estate. That's a must read. read. 
good. Yeah, it is a must read. It really, it really changes your mindset about how you look at the world and how you look at real estate. And that was, that was right there was the reason that I got into real estate. Yeah. Uh, Rich that Poor Dad is, is not a, a it's, it's not going to have all the principles in there to, yeah. to go do a deal is not going to have that. It's more of a mindset yeah. shift uh, for you guys uh, to, to change from what we're used to doing every single day and what we're taught since, I mean, this is corporate America, right? It's, you know, you, uh, you go to work and, and, and you come back home and then you go to work the next day and you go back home and, and you just, it's a cycle every single day. So yep. kind of, uh, it's a shift in your mindset basically. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a must read for, for you guys that haven't read it. So highly recommend that book. And, and uh, thanks a lot for bringing that up. Yep. Ben. Yep. Um, what do you believe is an investor's biggest fear or obstacle in real estate and what can they do to overcome it? I think it's the purchase price. I think people in general get scared by millions and millions of dollars. But once you get past that fear of the purchase price and how much money we're talking about, you can go out and you can do a $20 million deal. You know, um, for me, that doesn't even matter anymore because I've learned how the process works. I know how I can leverage other people's time and experience in order to take down deals of that size. But at the beginning, people feel like, well, I don't have the team involved or I don't have this, I don't have that. There's no way I can buy a, even a $5 million deal on my own. But really, once they've gotten all those pieces together, you can take down a $50 million deal. You know, and obviously that takes some coordination, that takes the right type of partners and the right level of skill set, right? But it's definitely all doable. You know, I mean, I've seen people that are taking down $30 million deals and they're not any smarter than any of the other people that I've met. They've just been able to gather that experience over the years. And they've been able to put in, and put in place these different partners that really know what they're doing and they can go out and do those deals. So I would say that's the number one fear that I see from people is that, you know, they're, they're concerned you know, about, um, the extra zeros, there's extra zeros, right? Yeah. It really is not, not that big of a deal. It's uh, really if, not. if you can do a, you know, $50,000 deal, then you can do a $5 million deal. It's, no, it, don't get me wrong. It, you know, it'll take some more equity. Well, yeah, it's gonna take more the, equity. It's gonna take more experience. Gonna but want to see a little bit more experience, but right. Right. In but, the but end, you can do it's it. Doable. Yeah. It's, it's doable. Definitely. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. What do you envision for your business long-term future? You know, I mean, I, I hope that, you know, in three to five years that I could be doing this, you know, full time. And that's the reason why you want to scale up. So I'd say that, you know, in the future, you know, doing this more full time, you know, as a real estate investment firm, you know, that's my goal. And so, you know, I, I think that that's certainly doable, you know, even after a few deals, depending on, you know, how big you go and how much you want to scale up. You know, you got to figure, you know, depending on, you know, how much, you know, you, sweat equity you get and, you know, what kind of asset management fees you're taking and all this other stuff, five, six, seven, eight deals after that, you could probably have a six figure income, you know? So, I mean, I always suggest that, you know, people need to really, um, you know, be looking at that, you know, as, you know, it's not, it's no longer a hobby it's a now it's a career and how do i go about making that happen and so that's what i'm kind of looking to do you know in the future great great mm -hmm. and just a few a few short words uh at the end of your life how do you want to be remembered <laughs> I want to be remembered as somebody that gives back, right? You know, I mean, I run a meetup in, in Houston. You've been to a Houston, Houston investment team. You know, um, I, I give back a lot of content. And the reason being is that the, the, the type of person that I am, I don't want to hold anything close to the chest. I don't want anybody, I'm not greedy. I don't want anybody to think that I'm trying to get them to pay for something or whatever. So I always want people to, you know, if they look at me or they remember me in the future, you know, that, Hey, he's a good guy. And he gave back. He was, he was willing to answer questions, you know, because it really is a, it's something that the institutional guys have known about for quite some time. Apartments that is, they didn't really want a whole lot of people to know about this stuff, No, they don't. you know, so you have to go out and you have to gain that knowledge. And I want people, you know, just regular people, just like me, uh, to know how that, how that works and, and give back that knowledge that I've learned and I've accumulated over the years. So that's what I want people to, to remember me by. Great, great points. I love that. Yep. Where can Commit to Wealth Nation uh, go to contact you and find out more about you? Okay. Um, well, uh, for me, you know, my contact information, obviously, you can, you can reach me at uh, ben at disruptequity.com. 
you know, I think that's probably the best way, you know, obviously I'm running around doing on several different things. So, you know, sometimes they get me on the phone is a little bit difficult, right. Or get me on a, <laughs> yeah. on a podcast. Right. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, I, I think, uh, email, uh, you know, we're also coming out with a website. It's going to be disruptequity.com. We should be able to launch that probably the next month or so. Obviously that will, that will give us a little, give people a lot more information about us and me and my business partner, Ferris Musa. So, um, I think that's the best way for people to contact me. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, so guys check them out. It's, uh, as you said, it was Ben at uh, disrupt equity. Yes. Yep. Check it out guys. And, uh, and Ben is a great guy and, and I'm, I'm sure you guys will, uh, if you guys ever, you know, contact him, then, uh, you're, you're going to be in good hands. And so, uh, um, Ben, I appreciate, I appreciate, appreciate you, uh, you being on the show and I appreciate your time and, and the value that you brought to, to the show and, and to, to our, uh, to our listeners. And, um, I wish you the best. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was good, good uh, experience. And uh, uh, hopefully I gave back some value to your listeners. Oh, you did. You did. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, okay. man. All right. Bye.